In the United States, we typically, when we... Okay, but let, let me pull this back. In the United States, when you begin with the church, and the church determines the mission, and the mission defines who Jesus is, instead of the other way around, meaning you determine how life is supposed to be, your cultural lenses, biases, or whatever the case may be, what happens is, you read this verse and you're going to say this in America. Therefore, go and make converts. I'm all for people coming to Christ. But in the Bible, through the entire Bible, coming to Jesus is becoming a disciple. Discipleship has been divorced from conversion. So in today's culture, you have people who have come to know Christ as personal Savior, and I am not judging, neither denying people coming to know Christ. Are you following me? I'm not saying it's not real. All that I'm saying is that we, as Christians, we as churches, when we decide to determine the mission, when we decide to determine who Jesus is, we conveniently create a divorce. So some of us, we have children, spouses, parents, right now are away from God and we excuse them. We pray that God will touch them again. We, we use this non-biblical word, in my opinion, it's not biblical, the word that talks about kind of a, the, the, the sense of reconnecting, rekindling, uh, consecration to God. And the reason why I'm against that word is because I believe the word is repentance. I think it's repentance. So summer is coming up and youth, youth camp is going to come up. And a lot of our youth, you know what they're going to do in summer camp? They're going to reconnect with God. And I'm all for reconnecting with God. But I want to make sure that we understand that when you do not take Jesus for real, and His authority conquers, dominates everything within you, you've got to repent. You've got to repent. So the Bible says this, that we are supposed to, again, make disciples. So I want you to hear this for a second. This entire week, this entire week, as we approach our community with the message of the gospel, is not the goal. This is just the beginning of the journey. Right? We have a huge task because we are praying for 160 kids to come and join us throughout this week. Now, do you realize how much, how many kids are 160 kids? That's a lot of kids, right? 160 kids is a lot of families represented. So I want you to hear this for me. The task before us begins by sharing the uncompromising message of salvation. And the message of salvation is basically this. He has all authority. Not you. Jesus does. But this journey of now yielding and really living a life where he has all authority is called discipleship. So what I want to understand is this. The word evangelism is a synonym of discipleship. I'm going to say that one more time. Evangelism is a synonym of discipleship. So what I want you to kind of just portray this morning is how do we and how do we create a plan? See, one of the discussions that we have had for multiple meetings when it comes to the soccer camp is follow up. How are we going to follow up with people? And I have suggested this before you in the past because here is what I want you to, again, just bring this before you and think for a second how this works in us. When it comes to discipleship, it is the same impression, the same picture of a door that has a doorknob only from the inside. In evangelism, we have said that it's basically a door where Jesus is knocking. And the doorknob is only from the inside because only you can open the door. Right? So you open the door. Revelation 3.20 says that He comes in. He dwells with you. He eats with you. And we call this the sealing of the Holy Spirit. You've been baptized by the presence of God. And we, as Baptists, we approach the theology or the doctrine that once saved, always saved. Now listen to me for a second. That experience of evangelism is exactly the same experience in discipleship. 
You are sealed by the Spirit. Now you got to be filled by the Spirit or with the Spirit. And this discipleship is exactly the same door that was opened at the beginning to welcome Jesus for the first time to be saved. So we do not believe that you get to be saved multiple times. We just believe that once you are saved, watch this, once you are saved does not imply that you are filled with the Spirit of God. Because every single Christian licks the presence of God. I'm not saying that you lose your salvation. All that I'm saying is that on a daily basis, you welcome the Holy Spirit to fill you up. And this is what we call the process of sanctification. As a church, we're inviting you to really portray this because look at how the Bible describes this. Again, we're called to make disciples. It's the same verse. And then he goes on and says, you're going to make disciples to all the nations. And again, this is where it gets, this is where it gets kind of a challenging for us. You make disciples to all the nations. And when you approach all the nations, you have to think in those terms of helping people to love God, helping people to love others. We call this Sunday school, worship Sunday school, and then love the world by serving. You still have time to serve. And, and I'll be honest with you, the order has nothing to do with importance. I believe you can serve without loving God. I think you can do that. I'm okay with that. I think you can serve without plugging into a small group of Sunday school. You can still do that. So we can always use hands and feet and, and, and just the presence of those who have embraced the gospel. So think about for a second, because again, the disciples are supposed to be done all across the nations, which implies when it comes to this surprising message of Jesus. See, again, the Jews thought that there was only them geographically, no one else, it was just them. See, one of the things that you appreciate when you go to places like Europe, and you go to places like, again, Eastern Europe, or whatever, all these all this places is, you appreciate and you are reminded, you are reminded um, how the gospel has penetrated generations. And what he said is true. We... Westerners in America, we are the result of this gospel moving through our generation, moving through the nations. So today, what I want to say to you is this. Jesus' implication of a universal message that is for all people, all generations, all lands, all nations, I want to hear this, I believe is the antidote of what many people by default will fall into, which is self-righteousness. I want you to listen to me for a second. Many of us, when we come to Christ, we keep on perpetuating self-centeredness. And all that I'm trying to tell you is this. Soccer camp this week, having 17 people from across the world coming and join us on this amazing task is nothing else but, hear me say this, is nothing else but basically saying it's not about me. It's not about me. Because I don't know about you guys, but again, I said this before and I'm going to say it again. The number one enemy, the number one thread of your very own joy is, it's you. Nobody threatens your very own joy. It's not your grandmother, it's not the Obamacare, it's not, you know, your in-laws. It's you. It's you. So, so, so all that we're trying to do to do is... When we provide opportunities to do a soccer camp, which I'm just warning you, 160 kids in this building is going to get really crazy. It's not going to feel like your typical church, all right? Are you, are you, uh, listen, we are praying that we will attract people that they do not know how to behave in church. I'm all for church people, don't get me wrong. I like them. Most of them. But all that I'm saying to you right now, all that I'm trying to tell you is that when you understand that he has the authority, and the authority has set the standard that this is a message that has to be conveyed all across the world, that has to be taken and driven into places that you've never been, that you never thought you would ever be, that, that, that you have a sense of urgency. This is the moment where preconceived ideas are going to disappear and really dissipate, and here's what I'm trying to tell you. Is going to take, and it has taken, an unselfish church to reach far Texas. That's all that I'm going to say to you. Reaching the world is no accident or coincidence. Right? It's not. It doesn't happen like that. 
Having 17 people from across the world with us this morning, it was an accidental. You and I moving and going and joining and really, again, lining up with God's agenda is not going to be accidental. It's purposeful. And I'm here to tell you this, just just, just personal deal. I, I, I like you guys and, and, and you guys are wonderful people. Listen to me. The best way to get over yourself is to embrace that the gospel was not... Jesus didn't die for you. Jesus died for the world. You just happen to be a human being. It's not about you. It's not about me. And right now, this week, is one of the most tangible ways to do this. Because just picture, picture with me, just, just dream for a second. Can you imagine a marriage that is not about me? Counselors will go broke. Picture raising teenagers that they understand that it's not about them. Mercy. That would be a different picture in my home. I got three. And it's the bottom of the wheels. It's just this, ah, ah, how come you don't listen? How come you don't understand me? And it's just back and forth. And some of us are so good at this back and forth that we will use biblical verses to get our point across. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? I mean, it's just this thing of us, again, getting over ourselves and really understanding that this message is literally for all nations. So maybe, maybe, listen, listen. Maybe, just maybe, just, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe, again, this is just me. Maybe this week, we have a group of people who are going to be saved from hell. But maybe this saving from hell begins by a church that is saved from self. Otherwise, what will be the church that says, do as I say, instead of do as I do. And by the way, but just, just, just again, because the longer... Okay. I don't want to miss the age because I'm 41 now, so I, it's tough, it's tough. 41 is a tough deal right now, okay? It's a tough deal. Like, but it seems to me, it seems to me that the older that you get, the more you forget what it used to be to be this age. So I want you to listen to this for a second. Our generation, 160 kids in this place will never be impressed by your doctrine and your theology. They will not. Now, this is hard for me to swallow because I have spent the last 20 years of my life studying doctrine in seminaries and schools. And it seems to me that people today, they're not impressed by how much I know. They're impressed when we find and see people that they have been over themselves. Right? When Jesus says, all authority is given unto me, Jesus, and, and I, this, this is my training, Jesus didn't just simply show up, went to a cross, died on a cross, came back from the dead on the third day, and just said, all authority is given unto me. I believe Jesus, the pilgrimage of being born from a virgin, walking childhood, adolescence, young adult, and then again journeyed into a ministry where he selects 12 other people to do life with them. Coming to this place to say, all authority is given unto me, is something that he has earned in the eyes of the beholder. And I believe this morning, we have an opportunity to redeem ourselves in that regard. And literally convey to our generation that we are not just here to convey principles. It's, it's based on principles what we do, so we better know our doctrine, but it's more than just simply doctrine. It's literally people who are sacrificially giving up themselves, giving up their resources. I mean, come on guys, 17 people, from across the world to reach out a bunch of people from far Texas. That, one of the things that just crushes my heart is most of these folks, they haven't been in any other place in the United States. So my argument is they haven't been in the United States. You didn't get the joke. But I don't think that Alice is the United States. It's very close to the United States. But I don't think this is the United States. That's just my take on that one. Okay? But seriously. Come on, we, we, we have to understand this message that this is where we get over ourselves. So let me, let me just read how this approaching to the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So here we go. This issue of baptism is a byproduct of repentance, faith, obedience, and perseverance. This is the full package of the gospel. It begins with baptism, so listen to me for a second. Baptism is important, and again, this is why we have to have a plan of action. 
plan of action. How do we take people from just coming to a soccer camp to become fully developed followers of Jesus Christ? But baptism, like many other ordinances, like many other practices, are totally meaningless. They will, be, be, they will become totally meaning, meaningless unless we understand, listen, unless we understand that this baptism has to be done according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, in the name of the Father. In the name, see, you got to remember this. Names mean character. They, they will represent character. When we talk about baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're basically saying we are in agreement, lining up with the character of Jesus. When you pray and you say, in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, what you have implied is that everything you pray is lining up with the character of Jesus. Because all authority was given unto you. So again, think about what we're saying. Repentance, faith, obedience, and the last one is huge, perseverance. Now, would you please just listen before I pray? See, part of what we're describing this morning is this. And I believe as we get into this week of work, hard work, evangelism, sharing the gospel, please listen to me for a second. We have to convey to our, to our community, to our generation, that literally the assurance of your salvation cannot be in prayer. We will do many prayers in this building this week. We will see people coming to know Christ. We believe God is going to give us divine appointments. Some of those things. But I want to listen to this. The evidence, the evidence of your salvation is your life is time. It begins with a prayer. It almost sounds like works. And you heard this from me before. I believe we're saved by works. The works of Jesus. The works of Jesus. So this morning, when you look at the last verse, and you see how he commands to teach them to, not memorization, but obedience, every single thing I have commanded you, and I surely will be with you, I surely am with you, to the very ends of the age. We are inviting people to do three things this week, to welcome a person, his name is Jesus. We're inviting people to literally imitate or emulate a person. We call this Christ likeness, growing discipleship. And the last one is to believe everything that he said about himself. We believe that's the message. We believe that's the message because he said at the end, I surely be with you always. The beautiful thing about the gospel, and I hope and you guys can see this because Again, we, it, it is funny, I mean, well, kind of funny, I'm not very funny, but it's kind of funny. Here we are for a soccer camp, with a couple of acres in the back, right? 17 people from across the world, coming and joining, and by the way, these guys are good at soccer. Alright, so, they're good, they're good at soccer, they do, they're good at what they do, okay? Listen to me for a second. Isn't that kind of a funny that is raining? Like God didn't get the memo. Come on. We've been praying over this camp. Here's the point. Would it be possible that the rain this morning, just, and again, I don't want to stretch this too much, but would, would it be possible that the rain this morning is a reminder that it's not about falling in love with the things that we do for God, but it's falling in love with the presence of God. Because the promise was that He was going to be with us until the end of the age. All that we want to try to do this community, in this church, throughout this week, is for people to understand that God has always been present. Always. He's always pursuing humanity. He's always pursuing families. He's always pursuing people. It's just now people being in the proper context, in the proper experience where they can respond positively to that gospel message.